Recording in progress. Okay, good. Uh, and we'll start with Sajad. Come on over and get us started. You have to be in Zoom and you have to share your screen. Oh, if you go to general, to the general, and click on that link over there, it will put you right in the right place. There you go. Okay, let me see if I'm here. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, let me see. Okay, hi everyone. Um, since time is short, I'll go fast. So, um, I'm Sajad, and we all heard about BIDS standards, brain imaging data structure. I know uh, many of you have already worked with BIDS. What I'm going to show for just two minutes is um, what BIDS apps are. So these are applications that are built based on this BIDS standard. And if you have your data, um, your neuroimaging data in BIDS, you can very easily apply all these BIDS apps on top of your data. If I go to if I'm just Googling bids apps, then the first link takes me to this page. If I click on apps, there are so many beautiful bids apps, maybe 30 something. Uh, some of them are very, uh, let me see, fMRI prep, where is it? Okay. So many of you, might know about fMRI prep, which is for pre-processing your data. Um, I wanted to specifically show you this um, BIDS app that I've been working on for a couple of years. And I hope um, to get some feedback on this in the future. You can all, this is open source. You can all join this project, extend this into uh, any way you think uh, might be useful. If I open this, Bids apps, Pine VPA. So this is a Bids app that performs multivariate analysis. It does ROI-based classification, searchlight. If you are interested in representational similarity analysis, that's also one possibility, which was implemented just last week. And the poster I presented was um, based on this um, Bids app, Pine VPA Bids app. And there is documentation and all that uh, available here. I'll just end by showing you one example, uh, showing you how easy this is to run. So the only thing we need is to just have your data set in bits format. And this is basically it. Other than just a like one, two other steps you need to take, you are, all you need to do is these few lines of code, which you're familiar with. Um, we learned last week how to run these Docker containers, uh, which we pull from Docker. We see Docker run. Then we are just mounting some local folders from our computers into this container using this dash V flag here. Then um, if anyone is interested in using this um, bids app for any searchlight or RSA analysis, I'm happy to um, talk more about the details, but it basically goes um, that we are running this particular bits app, Pine VPA, and see how this easy this is. I'm just saying what task in my experiment I'm gonna work on. Let's say I'm doing some classification. I do dash C classification, um, classify objects versus human for me. Do these subjects one through five. If uh, anyone's familiar with LSS or, or GLM single that Kendrick talked about, you can rather than OLS run LSS. Um, if you wanna do, I'm adding multiple um, flags in just one line, but you're, if you're not doing classification, you're doing RSA, you can as easy as that, just enable RSA. And um, there are other, um, arguments you can add into here. Dash S simply performs some searchlight analysis. 
And that's it. This is just one quick overview. If anyone's interested in using this, or if you wanna join in the future and add something to this app, I'm happy to talk more. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. The next speaker is Hui Xin. Who is here or online on Zoom? Or not? Let's skip forward and come back later. Let's see if uh, Hui Xin appears. Uh, Daniela. No slides, come on over here. Okay. So yeah, stand, stand close here. All right, what? Um, can you guys hear me well with this? It's weird with a mask, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, hi everyone, my name is Daniela Casillo. I'm a rising third year PhD student at uh, UC Irvine in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior. Sorry, Zoom, I keep forgetting you guys for a second. Um, so today I just wanna give a brief little talk about the research I've been doing as part of my PhD work. And so for a quick second, I want you guys to take a moment and just think about how you got to this space from Willow to here. Think about what landmarks you saw, how you got yourself here, whether you're still using GPS or you're able to get yourself to this spot without it. Now, I want you to think about when you first got here. Now, imagine you got out of that light rail and you had to get yourself to Willow. Are you one of those people that looked at the map that was provided for you and looked at it and were like, yeah, I can get myself there? Or are you like me and you put that GPS on before you even stepped out of that light rail because you knew you were going to get lost? So one of the big questions that my lab is really interested in is what are the individual differences that underlie spatial navigation? In other words, why are some people really good at this kind of behavior and other of us are just really bad? And if you think about it, it's something that's really, really important to our everyday lives. You use it all the time, whether you really realize it, whether you're in a new environment or you're simply trying to get from a place you've already been to a thousand times, you're still using that ability. And so what, the way I approach this in my work, there's two different ways. One is through a behavioral approach. So simply looking at someone's behavior and how they navigate. Uh, specifically, if we're looking at how people explore or how people take in this kind of spatial information. So are really good navigators somehow learning information differently? Are they using different strategies? Are they using specific cues to get that information? Um, and the the second part of that kind of behavior is kind of testing and seeing whether it's an issue of recalling that. So are they learning it and they're learning the same way, they're using the same cues, but for some reason, bad navigators are just not being able to recall that information. Um, and so I'll kind of give you an example of that. So I'm a bad navigator and I think last Friday, actually, don't laugh at that, I mean, you're going to, but I went to the bathroom and the bathroom's right over there. And I walked out and immediately took a left turn. Did not know, I got out, was very confused, took a left turn, kept walking, was like, this looks wrong. Turned back around, walked, and then saw people and was like, oh, okay. So, you know, was it a problem that I just didn't learn it or that I just am really bad at recalling where I am? And so we can use that kind of like behavioral approach. Now, the second part of my work comes in with focusing on kind of, the the neural connectivity that's going on in your brain is it a difference of brain structure is my brain different than yours is your hippocampus bigger than mine is that's what's going on and for this i focus on white matter specifically and so i'm looking at whether white matter integrity is correlated to this navigational ability so is your white matter structure better than mine in regions that are uh, related to spatial navigation and so that's the way I kind of approach this. And so the big part of this and why we kind of want to study this is that we can potentially use these tools, this white matter structural 
measurement or these behavioral tools for earlier and better diagnoses or treatments in patients that have early, um, early aging cognitive impairments, specifically people with Alzheimer's disease because spatial navigation and learning and memory is one of the first few behaviors to go at that stage. And so with that, I just kind of want to thank you guys for letting me talk. Um, and if you have any questions about navigation, want to hear me drone on and on, Slack me or come find me later this week. Thank you. All right, next is uh, Jake DeRosa. Stay around here if you can follow it here. And then share your screen. Yeah, let's, uh, uh, yeah, try to print it to PDF and Slack it to me and then we'll, okay, we'll uh, move Jake back and go to Patricia, who I believe is on Zoom. Yes, hi, I'm here, uh, just, just a second. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so, hi, I'm Patricia. And I thought that I would like to take this opportunity to advertise a data set that was released uh, last year uh, by the team in which I work. Um, the dataset name is Danensky Symphonia EEG ERP dataset. So last Monday, we have heard that it's good to obtain huge neuroimaging datasets, like 1,000 of participants or so. Um, so this is not the case. Here we have smaller one with 42 participants. And we have also heard that this would be good to uh, have more inclusive data sets. So it's also not the case. Uh, here uh, is the standard right-handed healthy young adults data set uh, with equal uh, number of females and males. And now for something good. So we have four tasks, uh, multi-source interference task, oddball task, uh, simple reaction time task, and resting state. And it's all already prepared in bits format that we have also learned about last week. Uh, it's uh, already open and available to download via uh, Giga database. And there is Giga Science uh, data node describing in detail each task and the whole data set. And initial behavioral and ERP results um, are available, uh, which shows the reliability of the data. And additionally, there is uh, some psychometric uh, data available 
and um, the EEG was recorded with high density montage with 128 electrodes. Uh, it can be used uh, combining uh, we, it with, with other data sets um, to solve uh, some problems and answer some questions related to time on task problems, attention fingerprinting, conflict processing, cognitive control, and other. Um, the data set is also available on Kaggle, uh, where the discussion uh, related to data set of itself uh, or, the, or the results can be opened. Uh, so, if anyone would like to try out some of the tools that we were um, uh, that were presented here on Neurohack Academy, then feel free to download it and and uh, give it give it a try and play with it. Thanks. That's all from me. Thanks, Patricia. Um, and now next is Alicia. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Well, great. Uh, I'm Alicia. I'm also from Nansky, so that's a nice coincidence. And uh, when I was presenting my poster, uh, I got a lot of feedback that it looked nice. And a lot of people were saying, I can never make my figures or my posters look that nice. And uh, I think that's not true. And I want to tell you very simple things that you can do to improve the visuals that you have for your figures and for your talks, your posters. Um, so first of all, uh, you don't need to have fancy software. All of these things that I show you are done with free tools or things like this was done in PowerPoint, really. So uh, you don't need fancy software. You don't need much skills. You need to know a couple of tricks. Um, here are some pictures that are from my actual publications or talks, etc. cetera. Uh, they usually get the feedback that they look quite pretty. Uh, this was also done in PowerPoint, by the way. Um, and a couple of things that, oh, and this is a results picture. So not only methods, but also results. So first of all, you need, you need to think of the figure that it has to be clear and readable. And readable re refers to what you read, so text. So you need to choose a good font. Uh, you can use standard fonts, which many of them are awesome, but if you're looking for something more fancy, there's plenty of resources, for example, such as Google fonts, which will give you beautiful fonts, which are very well readable, most of them. I would opt for the one which are sans serif, so without the little dashes on top of letters, but that's your choice. It doesn't have to be. Uh, I can also recommend you for something more fancy, this Ex Libris Font Foundry. It's based in the Netherlands. It has a lot of free options for very beautiful fonts. But if you look for fonts online, many of them will be proprietary. You will have to pay for them. These are free. Um, second of all, the clarity refers to the room that you have in your picture. So we tend to want to include a lot and a lot and a lot and fill that space with information. But what you need for the figures to look, be readable and clear is the white space. So the space where there's nothing in there. And many tools will give you things called guidelines. Here I highlighted the guidelines for presentations that will basically show where should you concentrate your information. And you should try to stay out of the margins as much as possible. And remember, the more room to brief your figure has, the more readable and clear it will be. Um, third thing is when you use color, be mindful that not everybody perceives color the way you do. Usually palettes that work well for colorblind people work very well as well for people who see color. So don't be afraid of using them. There's uh, plenty of that on the internet, just Google colorblind color palettes and you will find really a lot of them. Um, the Viridis is a great color palette in the family to use. Uh, there are other options. This is one example. Um, and here I have some resources that I use 
uh, which are software based. So Seabon, obviously, we had. If you haven't been to Ariel's talk on visualization, he shows Seabon and some other tools which are very handy. Canva, which I use for this presentation, extremely easy. A lot of free resources that you can use, um, which are also copyright free, so you don't have issues with that. Inkscape, which is free, makes you use uh, make your own vector graphics. It takes a little bit getting used to, so it does require a little bit of skill. Uh, Flat Icon, which is a great resource for having those little icons that you put here and there just to guide your visuals around. Um, it does require uh, attribution if you download them for free, but you can download them for free. And uh, there are some more, but I don't really much have much time. So thank you. I hope this would give you a little bit of hope that, and, and confidence that you can also make your figures pretty. Thanks a lot. Okay, next is Max and then boom. Put your laptop down here. Oh, yeah, here, here we go. Uh, are you on Zoom? Uh, no. Do you have Slack in here? Let's go to the next one so I can show you that. Okay. We'll go on to the next one. Uh, Monica. You're up. It's a video. Wait, is that is that cheating if you're not giving it yourself? Oh, okay. It's it's past you. Uh, I guess it is. I guess I guess we're doing it. Um, I wanted to do a video by talking you to say if you see this, do you think that it looks nice? I want to like, really reinforce that sometimes it is worth the effort to put in more on the front end. Whoa, sorry. To put in more on the front end to get a nice, concise, well animated video where sometimes you can explain things better with graphics that you have to pre record. Um, okay, cool. So that's that. If you think this looks nice, ask me later about the app that I used to make it. Oh my God. Hi there, I'm Monica Tier, and I just finished my PhD with Dr. Kevin Oxner in the Department of Psychology at Columbia University. In this video- Oops. Let's try that again. Can you hear it through the speaker? Oh, it's not sharing. Oh, okay, I'm sharing. I'm sharing the wrong side here. I'll be showing you some of my recent work on how categorizing affect increases affective representation. Sorry about that. Uh, Monica Tew, and I just finished my PhD with Dr. Kevin Oxner in the Department of Psychology at Columbia University. In this video post, I'll be showing you some of the. If we stop to share, I'm just gonna go back to my laptop and see if we can. Hi there, 
I'm Monica Tew, and I just finished my PhD with Dr. Kevin Oxner in the Department of Psychology at Columbia University. In this video poster, I'll be showing you some of my recent work on how categorizing affect increases affective representational distance. Valence space varies continuously. We can experience valence anywhere from very negative to very positive to somewhere in between. But we also readily chop that space up when we categorize our affective experience using emotion words like distraught, worried, or serene. When we categorize our affective experience, could we actually be changing the underlying neural representation of continuous valence space? We investigated this by recruiting 25 young adults to report their affective response to a series of short videos during fMRI scanning. In the scanner, participants watched seven second videos selected to elicit four different types of affect, neutral, positive, negative, and mixed, where they might plausibly experience a simultaneously positive and negative response. For each video, participants reported their affective response from positive to negative. Importantly, on one half of trials, Participants had to make a categorical forced choice response and pick either positive or negative. While on the other half of trials, participants could choose anywhere along a continuous slider between positive and negative. We measured bold activity patterns in response to each affect category in parcels across the cortex. Then within each parcel, we calculated the representational distance between spatial activity patterns for each pair of affect types, neutral and positive, negative and mixed, and so on for every possible pair. We then used pattern similarity analysis to measure how those pairwise distances between affect patterns varied as a function of whether participants had been reporting their affect categorically or continuously. We found that the average distance between categorical response bold patterns, that is, between any possible pair of affect patterns that were judged categorically, was greater than the average distance between continuous response bold patterns in the following regions. The left intraparietal sulcus, associated with representations of conceptual distance along a dimension, and bilateral medial prefrontal regions associated with cognitive control and perhaps representation of affective category knowledge. When we look more specifically at differences in pattern distance between bold patterns specifically for positive and negative affect videos, we see that categorization again increases representational distance, this time in a broader set of regions. Like again, the left intraparietal sulcus and bilateral medial prefrontal cortex, as well as left ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which has been associated with deploying cognitive control to select relevant information from long-term memory, the bilateral anterior insula, associated with primary affective processing and receiving interoceptive inputs from the body, and the bilateral lingual gyrus, associated with high-level visual processing which here makes sense because participants were watching dynamic affective scenes unfolding. These results show that categorizing affect magnifies affective representational distance, especially between positive and negative affect representations in regions associated with primary perceptual and affective processing, conceptual distance, cognitive control, and affective category knowledge. Activating category information and applying labels to our affective experience indeed appears to make representations of those experiences more neurally distinct. Future research can expand upon this work to investigate individual differences in how categorization might change affect representations and how those differences might relate to individual differences in emotional health and well-being. Nice, thanks. Um, let's, uh, while I'm sharing my screen, let me see if I can get Jake's uh, presentation up here.
can believe I can do. Uh, control control P. No, that's the wrong wrong control. Uh, yeah, here you can uh, if you hit the down button here then okay. it's perfect. Here you go. Um, so I am working on the adolescent brain cognitive development study. And if you don't know what that is, it is the largest um, adolescent and brain longitudinal study in the United States. So right now they've exceeded um, over 10,000 participants uh, across multiple different time points. So what I'm using is functional connectivity to derive data-driven subtypes of how individuals cluster together based on how their brain communicates at rest. So just to walk you through my processing pipeline, what we have is, again, 10,000 individual, over 10,000 individuals uh, with functional MRI data at baseline and a two-year follow-up. So we're going to be using uh, the Gordon parcellations that came from the Dosenbach paper uh, to derive these functional <coughs> subtypes. But one of the first things that I do is actually split the data. So I'm working uh, with two different splits. So there's about 5,000 individuals in split one and about 5,000 in split two. And what I do is I apply bagging enhanced Leiden community detection uh, to both of these splits to derive data-driven subtypes of functional brain organization. And what we arrive at is four stable subtypes that reproduce um, across the splits and also at the second time point. So just to give you a little bit more of an idea of what these subtype profiles look like, what we're going to be using is all the networks, and we're going to be examining what their functional connectivity looks like. So in this graph right here, we're going to see the lines are going to be weighted by the strength of their connectivity, and the red lines indicate higher positive functional connectivity, and the blue lines indicate negative functional connectivity. So just to give you an idea of what these profiles look like, you can see automatically that they do differ. And it becomes quite interesting as we begin to relate these things to behavior and executive functioning and cognition, because if we're going to be thinking about, for example, you know, what are the primary indicators of cognition, you might immediately jump to the frontal parietal control network. But one of the things that we're noticing about these subtypes is that functional connectivity in the frontal parietal control network isn't necessarily one of the major predictors of these subtypes or in terms of their feature importance. So one of the first things that we're gonna to begin to look at is how can we define what are the most important features of these subtypes? So using SHAP values in classification, we identify just some of the features that are more indicative of what represents these subtypes the most. And if you'd be interested in discussing you know, what these values mean after this presentation, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, but again, this is just some initial analyses that I've been conducting this past year to be able to identify what is important about these individuals and what connections seem to be the primary indicators. So another interesting thing that we do with these SHAP values is do it by individual as well. So one of the things that we could see here is that higher blue values would mean that more negative functional connectivity is the primary feature importance for these subtypes. And if we're looking at a higher red value, that would mean that higher functional connectivity between those two regions would be more indicative of what comprises these subtypes as the most important. Now, another interesting thing that we find is that this is baseline for sample one. Their profiles look very similar and we reproduce them quite well at a two-year follow-up. So one of the first questions you might ask is, okay, well, you know, you identify this at time point one, but how stable are they? How reproducible are they at time point two? And they're actually highly reproducible. And they're not just reproducible at the second time point, they're also reproducible across sample. And momentarily, we're going to see how strong the correlations are between not only uh, the sample splits, but also at the different time points. And the reason I'm showing you both of these splits and both of these samples is because one of my strong interests is in reproducibility. Um, and especially when we're working with these large data sets, we want to be able to make sure that what we're testing is able to be reproduced and can have strong power as we move forward. So the next plot that I'm showing you here is the max correlations between the subtypes across different time points. So the top um, is indicate, indicative of correlating across the different splits. So we see most of the correlations, in fact, all of them are above 0.9, which is indicative that what we're showing you here is quite reproducible. Now, if we're going to think about demographics, I'm not going to go too much into the demographic differences today, but one of the things that doesn't actually differ between these subtypes that much is age. 
which is pretty good because we want to see fairly consistent age distributions. So we're not attributing any of the differences that I'm going to show you next, just the differences in age. So let's look at cognitive and executive functioning for a moment. So one of the first things that's going to jump out is that subtype one and subtype four perform quite well on things like the NIH cognitive battery, the little man task, and the principal components that were derived using this study. However, another interesting thing that'll jump out is that subtypes two and subtypes three don't perform quite well. And we're gonna see this kind of consistent trend across most of the other cognitive and executive functioning measures within this study. So we could see if we're just looking at some pairwise comparisons that there are some pretty major differences. Now, if we jump to the Stroop task and we see cognitive control, again, one of the first things that we're gonna see is that subtype one and subtype four do perform quite well. And what's pretty interesting is that if we look at their actual functional connectivity profiles, they differ quite a bit. So one of the next things that I'm gonna be looking into, I haven't done this yet, is why are they so similar yet their functional connectivity profiles are so different compared to subtypes two and three, which perform quite low. And one of the interesting things about the Stroop task is that it becomes subtype two that actually has more um, differences when we're comparing against subtype one and subtype four. However, when we jump to the fMRI and back task, it becomes subtype three that becomes much more problematic and begins to jump out. Subtype two also doesn't have you know, the greatest MBAC scores, but they aren't as bad as subtype three. Another interesting thing that we're gonna to begin to look at now and relate this to is behavioral differences on the CBCL. So one of the things that we find is that subtype two actually shows higher attention problems compared to the other subtypes. And subtype three shows higher rule breaking behavior compared to the other subtypes. So now it becomes much more interesting because we're not just finding cognitive executive functioning differences. We're also finding differences in behavior. Um, so we're gonna to begin to investigate this more a little bit down the road as well. Um, but this is what we're gonna to begin to think of here. Could it be that subtype two does have more of an ADHD subtype? We haven't necessarily driven too deep into diagnostic data just yet, but one of the theories that we are working with is that we could potentially use these functional connectivity profiles to be able to relate to diagnostic information. The last interesting thing that I'm gonna to present today is differences in financial adversity. So not only do we see differences in behavior and cognitive executive functioning, we also find differences in finance, financial adversity, such that subtype three does show higher financial um, disadvantage compared to the other subtypes. And this becomes really interesting now because we're actually seeing the impact of financial adversity being able to be identified um, in the brain. And then the last few things that I do is just determine how well we can classify each subtype uh, with different algorithms. And the reason I present this is because you do see differences. And this is something to consider when you're running your own classification analyses, is that depending on the algorithm, you are going to get differences, and they will differ based on how well they're classifying each subtype. And this is actually consistent in both sample one and in sample two. And the one other classification analysis that we did was could we just use uh, behavior, demographics, age, parents married, and other information to predict these subtypes? We actually can't do that quite well. Um, so this becomes a lot more interesting because even though we do get these bigger differences in you know, these demographic and behavioral and cognitive variables, they actually don't do that great of a job at predicting these subtypes, which means that there's more that's underlying you know, these differences in our functional connectivity profiles. And the last thing I'll present to you today is looking across different time points. So if we look at baseline, we could see that there's um, what these individuals look like, but there is change. So people are moving from time point one to a two year follow up. And one of the things that we're going to begin to address is what's influencing these change and what are the top predictors of these change? Because if we refer back to subtype three and we found that they're more financially disadvantaged, one of the things that we find is that they are the subtype that actually moves the least. So if you're in subtype three and you're from a financially disadvantaged background, it's gonna be much harder to move up to subtype one or subtype four that perform much better on cognitive and executive functioning um, than moving from the other subtypes. So that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to talk more later, I'd be happy to do so. Great, thanks a lot.
Next, uh, Carolyn. I will stop sharing and let you share your screen. I don't know why PowerPoint's not coming up. Um, oh no, I was just, <laughs> was just scrolling down. <laughs> Okay, um, so we often think about chronic pain as being kind of a disorder of sensation, but really it kind of wreaks havoc with a lot of our systems, one of these being cognition. So in this study, I wanted to see how chronic pain affects cognitive flexibility. So my question was, is chronic pain causing a decrease in cognitive flexibility? Now this is the ability to adapt to changing outcomes. So to do this, I used a rodent model of chronic pain. So this rodent model, you um, ligate the L5 and L6. So these are in your lumbar region of your back. Um, I ligate those nerves, which causes a prolonged chronic pain phenotype. And then I trained these rats up in this um, task, which um, was a lever pressing task. So if the rats press the left lever, they got no reward. If they pressed the right lever, they got one sugar pellet. And so they did this for a week and then we changed it up on them. So in task two, if they pressed the left lever, they got four times the amount of food. If, if the right lever, they still just got the one sugar pellet. Um, so it would be preferable for them to switch their behavior over to the left. So, what we see here is we had three groups. So we had naive animals who've never had surgery and they performed switched over this task really quickly. So the dark blue is kind of like when they're still going for the left lever, which is now the lower rewarded and the yellow is the high reward. So this dark blue um, kind of fades out quite quickly in the naive and most of them have kind of started to learn it by about session seven. Um, in the sham animals, so these are animals which had a kind of a sham surgery. So we kind of put them under anesthesia and uh, gave them a kind of opened up their muscles to look at the nerve, but we didn't do anything to the nerve. Um, these animals were a little slower than naive because they have still had a surgery, even though they aren't showing any pain, but they still kind of picked up the task by around kind of session nine. Uh, whereas these animals, the SNL, so they are the spinal nerve ligation rats, um, they hardly picked up the task at all until kind of around sort of session 11, session 12, suggesting a decrease in cognitive flexibility with chronic pain. Um, so we wanted to kind of know why is this? So we just did a kind of a simple analysis that's normally used for looking how bursty neurons are. So normally you look at local variants in neurons to see how kind of temporal they are. So, you know, like, but we wanted to see how bursty rats are. Um, so what we did is like, if the local variance was around one, you had kind of a fairly like temperate kind of responding on the lever. So it would be kind of like press, 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 press. Whereas if it was over one, it would be bursty. So it would be like press, 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 stop, press, 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 press. And so what we found was that the um, animals with chronic pain tended to respond in bursts rather than at a more temperate kind of level. And so we thought, okay, well, maybe this is why they're getting distracted. They're like, you know, sniffing their asses or whatever in between. Um, but what we actually found was that burst responding correlates with better performance in the animals with chronic pain. So what does this all kind of mean? So we kind of proved our hypothesis, or we didn't really prove it, but we suggested to prove it, that chronic pain causes a decrease in cognitive flexibility. Um, but what I think was super interesting in the study was this kind of finding with the burst responding. 
what chronic pain takes up our limited cognitive resources, which is potentially the reason why they have that decrease in cognitive flexibility. And what I'm wondering is with the burst responding is, is it a sw does it represent a switch from cognitive to habitual learning? So is this bursting kind of more habitual behavior rather than sort of more the thoughtful cognitive stuff? Um, so I'll leave it there. And these are my acknowledgements. Thanks a lot, that was great. All right, Joanne. Uh, do I, let's try Vax again and uh, and then go on to others. Do you on Zoom now and ready to share? Yeah. Hello, everyone. My uh, my name is Max, and I'll be presenting a, a bit app for the detection of evoked uh, responses and the mapping of connectivity in IEG. Uh, this is a lab that I'm working with the lab of Dora Hermes at the uh, Mayo Clinic. Um, oh, click. Um, so I'm going to talk about CCPs, cortical cortical evoke potentials, and uh, Dora already explained a little bit about them. When you have a grid on top of the brain uh, and you stimulate between two electrodes, uh, you get can measure on all of the other electrodes, and you will measure a specific response. Here you see a, a no evoked response on this electrode. You also know your folks response, but if you stimulate, stimulate 10 times on these two electrodes and you get like 10 of these responses and you average them, which you see on the left, you can say, okay, we definitely see an evoked response. So there is something going on between the stimulated electrodes and through the brain at the uh, measured electrodes. Um, in the literature, a typical response you will see is an N1 response. It's a negative deflection within the first 100 milliseconds. Uh, However, when you actually look in the data, there's a lot of variety there. There's a difference in the width, the, the amplitude, uh, and, and there's all sorts of uh, things you can see in the, in the waveform, uh, which is a problem um, because uh, several studies, they use different uh, definitions uh, for the N1. They use different ways of detecting them, or some are manually, visual inspection, manual annotation. Some, they use automatic methods, but they say, okay, the thresholds is here. So all of the different studies, they come to different ways of detecting them, which can give different results. And especially in regard to uh, reproducibility of research, you actually want to have a consistent method over all of your data or most of the data. Um, oh yeah, so uh, standardization is important for the quantification, scientific reproducibility, and also for clinical workflows, because often this mapping is used in the clinic uh, to, to see where regions are connected and what to not dissect and what you should. Um, so we created a Docker app to do the automatic detection and do some visualization on this. And I have a movie, I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. What you see on the left is the input in bits format. Can you see my cursor here? It's here. Here you'll see a window where I will call a Docker run. And here on the right is an output folder. I'm gonna skip forward for the sake of time, but it just shows you that there's a TSV file, there's data in there and, um, I, I'm not going to go into the details of this command, but just assume that this is a Docker run, giving a directory, giving an output directory, and giving some arguments. It starts processing. It gives some information back. Um, that's all in the Docker. And you will see that it will start to produce output on the right, I think, here. There's a couple of files that are, are, are being outputted. Um, Configuration that has been used to detect the uh, N1. Um, oh, I kind of lost my bar here. I'm just going to get forward. Um, what's important about this Docker app is that it very efficiently loads the uh, IEG data because the IEG data is, is big in size. It's often like multiple kilohertz of, of, of recordings per second. And um, Docker by default allows very little memory to work with. So one of the feats in this Docker app is that it's very efficient with its memory. It has three detection methods. One is a local deviation threshold, which is 3.6 times below the standard deviation of the baseline, so which is before a stimulation. Intertrial consistency, considering that if um, a, a, a response is consistent over different trials, that, that actually is something besides noise. So there is a higher signal in there. And a response shape, 
uh, which is the typical S shape that you can see, or what, which I showed on the previous slide. You can combine these methods as well. So it's, it's a little bit of, uh, the default one is the top one. It's just a local uh, deviation. I'm just gonna quickly show some output. I don't know how long I have, but I think I should be fine. Converges the incoming connection, which you see on the, uh, on the uh, Y axis is the stimulated electrodes. And then uh, this is for one single, uh, for one single electrode response on the left, and you can see how, how that elicits different responses. On the right, you can see what happens if I stimulate on this pair, one pair, and how all of the other electrodes in the brain respond. But more interestingly is this visual output. These are the uh, heat map images, where on the left, you can see that all of the stimulated electrodes are listed on the y-axis, this goes for both, and on the x-axis, there's the response. So you can see where there's a cluster that there's definitely a connection between the stimulated electrode and the measured electrode. The left shows the amplitude of the response. The right shows the latency. So when you stimulate on one po point, there might be a slower response on a different electrode response electrode than on another. We've uh, validated the uh, outcome with uh, a, a data set, five participants from Mayo Clinic, uh, nine from the University Medical Center uh, Utrecht. What we did is we had have manually uh, uh, annotated uh, the N1 responses and compared these to the automatic detection. And then you can see these are the results. So it does a pretty reasonable job um, detecting uh, N1s or negative deflections. In summary, um, N1 evoked response can be ambiguous, and I think this BITS app will actually help to standardize this and increase the reproducibility. Thank you. That was great, thanks. Where were we? Uh, yes, uh, Joe Wen. Oh, here we are. Come on over. Here. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, today I'll be talking about my master's thesis project on uh, predict event support sequential memory encoding. So, um, so um, our experience or call knowledge or call schema determine where I remember from an event. So if I, had, if I were to watch a sports game, I probably won't remember anything from it. But if I watch a video game that I play, um, I'll probably remember a lot from it. So the idea is that our knowledge influence what we remember. And um, there can be many reasons. Uh, when we have knowledge, when we know what's going on, we will be motivated. And there are many other explanations, but uh, today I'm gonna focus on this one called prediction. So, um, the idea is our knowledge allow us to make predictions about what's coming up next and that help us remember. So to study that, we teach people to play a video game, uh, not a video game, a board game called four in a row. Um, this game is the generalization of tic-tac-toe where two players should compete to be the first one to connect four pieces in a row in, uh, the, in the different directions. So um, the advantage of using that game is that first, mo most people have never heard of the play the game before. So it's a novel game. It has a large state space, so it's very complex. It allows us to build some complex prediction models. And the, but the game is not too difficult to models. And um, the game is easy enough to learn in a relatively short period of time. So what we did is we conducted two longitudinal studies with six sessions. So participants coming for six days. Uh, one is online and one is us. So one study is online and one study is in, in person with eye tracking. So. The structure of the uh, day looked like this. Placements first do a memory task where they remember short sequences extracted from the game. And then they got a distractor and then they were shown the initial board and they reconstruct the sequence they just saw. So there are 30 trials in the memory task each day. And then they played the 40 games against AI. This is an opportunity for them to develop their schema and also allow us to measure how their schema change over time. So um, what we found first is that placement memory, uh, sorry, placement become better at remembering, uh, placement become better at playing the game. Um, so here in the y-axis is the ELO rating, which is a measure of how good of a player someone is. 
And then we also found that uh, they become better at remembering sequences from the game. This, the y-axis is the memory accuracy from the task. So what we do next is we try to build a model of how good probable move is under a near optimal gameplay policy. Um, this is a simple linear regression approach, but basically, um, in, for example, on this board, the most likely move is this one because it forms a three in a row in this direction and it block opponents two in a row in these two directions. So we apply this model to the board's POC during encoding, which gives us the probability of the potential next moves. So what we do next is that we look at people's eye movement when they're um, looking at the board. So here, um, here's an example of the fixation hit map when participants are looking at the board. And um, we think that where people look at during, um, in, during encoding when they're looking at the board reflect different encoding strategies. And the one that we care most about is this prediction strategy, which is using that model I just showed to show like what is the probability of the next move that's coming up. Um, so we use a linear regression model to predict the fixation from those six different regressors. And so the weights for each regressor represent the, the extent to which people use that particular strategy during encoding. So we first do a session level um, analysis to look at how much people, uh, to look at people's prediction coefficient across the six sessions. And we found an increase in people's predictions. So people predict more as they develop their knowledge of the game. Um, so we want to know whether this increased prediction is linked to memory improvement. Uh, so we look at it at a trial level. So um, if participants make more prediction during the current move, do they remember the move that's being predicted better? So um, we run a logistic regression to predict whether a move will be remembered based on the probability of the move and the prediction coefficient before the move shut up, which is how much participants predict the move. And we found that um, if participants made more predictions, they're more likely to remember the move. And this is independent of how probable the move is. So um, to conclude, by playing and remembering the games, people's memory for uh, people's memory for the game for sequences in the game improve, and uh, people make more predictions during uh, encoding and making predictions helpful for memory. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Rahul, come on over. Hi, I'm Rahul. Um, can you hear me? Perfect. Um, this will be quick. This is ongoing work that is somewhat related to brain stuff, um, voice proximity projects. So basically, the goal of this project is to understand if we can quantify the difference between a set of voices. So how similar or unsimilar are two voices? Um, so theoretically, if you could plot voices on some curve or some plot that looks like this, and you had a bunch of samples from different people, all the red people, green people, et cetera, could we say that voice one is uh, more similar to voice zero than voice two is? Um, this, the reason for this work, other than academic interest, is um, uh, for a collaborator who wants to scan participants and see if they respond uh, more uh, differently to familiar voices versus different voices. Um, and we wanted to give them a good way to quantify how similar or not voices are, because if two voices are acoustically similar, that could confound how the brain might respond. Um, so um, one natural question is how do we even produce a plot like this from voices or how do we do um, computation on voice? Um, so the voice is kind of this system where you have your lungs that produce air that cause your vocal folds to vibrate at a specific frequency, which is the fundamental frequency. And then they get fil gets filtered by all the other stuff um, all the other articulators, and then you can measure that, and then you have some kind of signal, and then you could do signal processing on it or different types of machine learning stuff on it. Um, and so 
One approach that we have been taking is looking at this process called speaker diarization. So basically, if you have a recording of a bunch of different people speaking, um, and you want to try and separate out individual speakers from each other, um, speaker diarization is the goal of doing that. Um, uh, you can kind of think of it as like a, as a classifier for those who kind of went through some of the deep learning things. Um, and so what we then look at is the, um, so yeah, it kind of gives you nice pretty clusters, but what we look at is the intermediate step. So basically what are the numbers that the model uses to classify a speaker as being different from someone else? So basically the model gives you these things called embeddings for each sample, you get uh, a 512 feature array. And then you can take a bunch of recordings and you can pass it through this embedding model and you can get for all your participants, you can get all the embeddings, which are just numbers that mean something in machine learning space, but uh, we don't really know what those mean to us. Um, and then a bunch of samples. Um, and then you could do a bunch of cool things with that. You can try and measure the distances between these and try and compare that to meaningful things like fundamental frequency or other acoustic things and say, is this meaningful? And we think that these for this specific model are somewhat meaningful, but we're still determining that. You can make pretty pictures by sending this through dimension reduction. So these are four different dimension reduction algorithms. I think a lot of you have probably heard of PCA before, but there's some other nonlinear methods like TSNE, UMAP, PACMAP is another random one that came out recently. And what's kind of cool is that each of these little blobs there are actually different participants with all the little dots or all of the samples from that one participant. Um, so then theoretically from this, we could say that one participant is similar or less similar to that part other participant in the context of the model, but we're still kind of figuring out how well this actually does. So, yep, that's all I got. Awesome, thanks a lot. Uh, and I believe the last talk will be by Hui. Uh, hi, can you hear me? I'm doing this over Zoom. On Zoom, okay. There we are, okay. Can you, can you share your screen? Sure, um, just give me a quick second here. No problem. Um, All right, great. We can see your screen now. But I, I don't think, think I think you'll oh. be seeing the right one. Now. Yeah, we're seeing the right. I think we're seeing the right screen right now, and we can also hear you. So please go ahead. Um, do you all see my screen right now? Uh, yeah, we can see your screen. Can you hear us? Can people hear me actually? Yeah, you can you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Oops, now we lost your screen. Um, sorry, can you say something? For some reason, I don't hear anyone. Hello, oh. can, you hear, can you hear me? Oh, okay, now it's great. Okay, great. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, let me try to do that again. Yeah, we, we, could, see your, we could see your slides uh, okay. Okay, okay, great. when you did that. All right, okay, I'll just get started right away. Yep. Um, all right, so sorry about that. Uh, I'm Hui Sin, space between my first name, and I'm uh, currently, I've finished my third year here at UC San Diego in the Cognitive Science Department, and I do 
research broadly on aging and psychiatric disorders. And specifically, um, I'd like to talk about the brain age prediction method. Um, and that stands for, so brain age stands for brain age gap estimation method. And essentially what we're trying to do here is predicting um, a person's age, biological age based on their neuroimaging scans. So I'll just briefly go with like um, some background. Uh, so essentially, if we want to like know how a person's brain is aging, we want to know, we want to first answer the question of what exactly is aging. Um, and we can look at um, some prior work that biologists have done. And essentially, um, we also know that as age increases, the prevalence of diseases increase as well. And a group of biologists back in 2013 uh, came up with this landmark paper. And essentially, they laid out this uh, nine sort of like hallmarks of aging. And um, basically, they reflect every biological system in the human body and the levels of proteins, organelles, and organs. And what they're saying is like aging affects indirectly and directly all biological components and processes in the body. So that might be sobering news, but uh, the good news is we have different ways of measuring the aging process. And as someone who's interested in the brain, I want to be able to understand how aging looks like uh, in the brain and the consequences of it. So at the lab I'm in, uh, which is acronym is the Brain Lab, Biopsychological Research on Aging Information Neuropsychiatry Lab in the medical school here, we primarily use neuroaging methods to study aging in the brain. And um, and I believe this is like familiar to many of us here, <laughs> and which is you see that here in the larger uh, the, the brains of the larger ventricles, the larger holes here in the middle, they are um, reflecting some sort of like mild cognitive impairment, so they have like very exhibiting some sort of um, uh, disease state compared to the healthy control. So that's a way for us to like it's just an example to show that we can use brain scans to sort of like detect. Um, Sort of like pathological processes. Um, so I'm going to skip that slide. And uh, essentially, um, now that we know that we can measure changes in the in brain features over time, we want to be able to come up with a model of brain aging. And this idea of modeling brain aging is predicated on the idea that there is a typical healthy brain aging trajectory. And the closer the individual is to a certain symptomatic threshold, the closer they are to cognitive decline. And there are events that can um, happen that can put an individual on a different trajectory. So for example, environmental insult or genetic factors that are kicking in, uh, which might put them at, at the greater risk for earlier decline. So by modeling brain age, we can characterize to the trajectory of healthy brain aging um, by measuring the distance from the typical trajectory. So um, in other words here, you see in this figure on the right here, um, there are some people who are at the same um, chronological, in, they're same in terms of chronological age, but they might be biologically younger or older. And um, given that there is this sort of um, variation in the rates of aging across individual uh, and the variation in um, region specific brain aging patterns, we want to be able to capture the heterogeneity of brain aging patterns um, using this single measure, which is the predicted brain age. So uh, I think one question I want to address is um, why does it make sense to look at brain aging in psychiatric disorders like bipolar, uh, because we know that there are many pathophysiological changes that are observed in bipolar. Not only there are structural alterations in the brain and cognitive deficits um, when people are assessed using neuropsychological tests, but there are also uh, higher incidence rates of aging related conditions like metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular related illnesses, and diabetes and hypertension. Um, so I'm not going to really go over this slide because in general, um, we've sort of like gone through a bunch of like machine learning, uh, sessions and tutorials, but essentially, um, 
there are many techniques that we can use to uh, obtain this predicted brain age. Um, there are many papers out there that I will show in the next slide. Uh, so here, um, uh, the first one is just an example of using risk regression. And then people have also used partial least square regression and um, convolutional neural networks as well. So uh, these are all trained on very huge um, amounts of data. A lot of them were um, obtained from actually different sites. And I believe um, the first one, yeah, the first one was actually uh, like pulled together from um, the Enigma made like MDD group, I believe. So um, questions that we're interested in our group is how does prediction performance on data from healthy participants vary across different machine learning pipelines? So we're interested in um, how different uh, models might perform on the same set of data, um, given their really different methods here. Um, and also, in particular, we're interested in what are the clinical correlates of um, this predicted brain age um, in bipolar disorder. So sort of like what kind of like pathologies or uh, features, like clinical features um, in bipolar that are correlated with a higher brain age. Um, so I'll end here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I think with that, we have uh, um, completed this uh, session of lightning talks. Let's uh, thank again all the speakers for the session. And then uh, continue hacking until at 3.30, we'll have uh, some breakouts, both in 103 and in the auditorium. See you then. <laughs>